The point of this channel is to offer a perspective on politics and economics according to libertarian municipalism. What is that? What is libertarian municipalism? In order to wrap our heads around this relatively new idea, this new like uh, ideological paradigm, we got to hit the books and use our brains. This will be a shared adventure between you, the audience, and myself. We are going to explore these new concepts together and see how they can be applied to our 21st century world. What is municipalism? This article, titled The Future We Deserve, is by Debbie Bookchin, writer and journalist. I am the daughter of two longtime municipalists. My mother, Beatrice Butchin, ran for the City Council of Burlington, Vermont in 1987 on the municipalist platform of building an ecological city, a moral economy, and above all, citizen assemblies that would contest the power of the nation-state. My father is the social theorist and libertarian municipalist, Murray Butchin. For many years, the left has struggled with the question of how to bring our ideas of equality, economic justice, and human rights to fruition. And my father's political trajectory is instructive for the argument that I want to make, that municipalism isn't just one of many ways to bring about social change, it is really the only way that we will successfully transform society. As someone who had grown up as a young communist and been deeply educated in Marxist theory, my father became deeply troubled by the economistic, reductionist modes of thinking that had historically permeated the Marxist left. He was searching for a more expansive notion of freedom, not just freedom from economic exploitation, but freedom from all manner of oppressions, race, class, gender, ethnicity. At the same time, in the early 1960s, it became increasingly clear to him that capitalism was on a collision course with the natural world. Murray believed that he could not address environmental problems piecemeal, trying to save redwood forests one day and opposing a nuclear power station the next because ecological stability was under attack by capitalism. That is to say, the profit motive. The grow-or-die ethos of capitalism was fundamentally at odds with the ecological stability of the planets. So he began to elaborate this idea that he called social ecology, which begins with the premise that all ecological problems are social problems. Murray said that, in order to heal our rapacious relationship with the natural world, we must fundamentally alter social relations. We have to end not only class oppression, but also domination and hierarchy at every level, whether it be the domination of women by men, of lesbians, gays, and transgender people by straights, of people of color by whites, or of the young by the old. So the question for him became, how do we bring a new egalitarian society into being? What types of alternative social organization will create a society in which truly emancipated human beings can flourish and heal our rift with the natural world? The question really is, what kind of political organization can best contest the power of the state? And so in the late 1960s, Murray began writing about a form of organization that he called libertarian municipalism. He believed that municipalism offered a third way out of the deadlock between the Marxist and anarchist traditions. Municipalism rejects seizing state power, which we all know from looking at the example of the Soviet Union, is a hopeless pursuit, a dead end, because the state, whether capitalist or socialist, with its faceless bureaucracy, is never responsive to the people. And, at the same time, activists must acknowledge that we won't achieve social change simply by taking our demands to the street. Large encampments and demonstrations may challenge the authority of the state, but they have not succeeded in usurping it. Those who engage only in the politics of protest or organizing on the margins of society must recognize that there will always be power. It does not simply dissolve. The question is, in whose hands will power reside? in those of the state with its centralized authority, or in those of the people at the local level. It is increasingly clear that we will never achieve the kind of fundamental social change we so desperately need simply by going to the ballot box. Social change won't be brought about by voting for the candidate who promises us $15 minimum wage, 
uh, free education or family leave, or who offers platitudes about social justice. When we confine ourselves to voting for the least of many evils, to the bones that social democracy throws our way, we play into and support the centralized state structure that is designed to keep us down forever. And, though often overlooked by the left, there is a rich history of directly democratic politics, of citizen self-government, from Athens in ancient Greece, to the Paris Commune, to the anarchist collectives of Spain in 1936, to Chiapas, Mexico, to Barcelona, and other Spanish cities and towns in recent years, and now to Rojava in Syria, where the Kurdish people have implemented a profoundly democratic project of self-rule unlike anything ever seen in the Middle East. A municipalist politics is about much more than bringing a progressive agenda to City Hall, important as that might be. Municipalism, or communalism as my father called it, returns politics to its original definition. A moral calling based on rationality, community, creativity, free association, and freedom. It is a richly articulated vision of a decentralized democracy in which people act together to chart a rational future. At a time when human rights, democracy, and the public good are under attack by increasingly nationalistic, authoritarian, centralized state governments, municipalism allows us to reclaim the public sphere for the exercise of authentic citizenship and freedom. Municipalism demands that we return power to ordinary citizens, that we reinvent what it means to do politics and what it means to be a citizen. True politics is the opposite of parliamentary politics. It begins at the base, in local assemblies. It is transparent with candidates who are 100% accountable to their neighborhood organizations, who are delegates rather than wheeling and dealing representatives. It celebrates the power of local assemblies to transform and be transformed by an increasingly enlightened citizenry. And it is celebratory. In the very act of doing politics, we become new human beings. We build an alternative to capitalist modernity. Municipalism asks, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to live in freedom? How do we organize society in ways that foster mutual aid, caring, and cooperation? These questions, and the politics that follow from them, carry an ethical imperative, not only because we must live in harmony with the natural world, or we destroy the basis for life itself, but also because we have a moral imperative to maximize equality and freedom. Maximize equality and freedom. The great news is that this politics is being articulated more and more vocally in horizontalist movements around the world in the factory recuperation politics of Argentina, in the water wars of Bolivia, in the neighborhood councils that have arisen in Italy, where the government was useless in assisting municipalities after severe flooding. Over and over, we see people organizing at the local level to take power. Indeed, to create a countervailing power that increasingly challenges the power and the authority of the nation state. These movements are taking the idea of democracy and expressing it to its fullest potential, creating a politics that meets human needs, that fosters sharing and cooperation, mutual aid and solidarity, that recognizes women must play a leadership role. Achieving this means taking our politics into every corner of our neighborhoods, doing what the conservatives around the world have done so successfully in the past few decades, running candidates at the municipal level. It also means creating a minimum program, such as ending home foreclosures, the repossession of mortgage cones by banks, stopping escalating rents and the destabilization of neighborhoods through gentrification. But we should also develop a maximum program in which we re-envision what society could be if we could build a caring economy, harness new technologies, and expand the potential of every human being to live in freedom and exercise their civic rights as members of flourishing, truly democratic communities. And we must confederate, work across state and national borders, developing programs that will address regional and even international issues. This is an important response to those who say we won't be able to solve great transnational problems by acting at the local level. In fact, it is precisely at the local level where these issues are being solved day in and day out. Even great issues such as climate change can be managed through the confederation of communities that send delegates to manage regional and even transcontinental issues. 
We don't need a centralized state bureaucracy. We need to create lasting political institutions at the local level, not merely politicians who articulate a social justice agenda. We need institutions that are directly democratic, egalitarian, transparent, fully accountable, anti-capitalist, and ecologically aware, and that give voice to the aspirations of the people. It will require time and education and the building of municipal assemblies as a countervailing power to the nation state, but this is our only hope of becoming the new human beings needed to build a new society. This is our time. Around the world, people want not merely to survive, but to live. If we were to transform from the death spiral society that decades of neoliberalism have foisted upon us to a new rational society that delivers on the promise of humankind, we must create a global network of fearless cities, towns, and villages. We deserve nothing less.